evening, everyone, and welcome back to those of you who have uh, attended some of these before, um, and those of you joining us for the first time, very warm welcome. So I'm really looking forward to this evening's session. We're going to be exploring um, the notoriously competitive world of curating, and we're going to hear from two alumni who graduated fairly recently in the big scheme of things, um, and have already forged brilliant careers as curators. Joining us from the US, where it's currently lunchtime, we have Heather Nichols, who completed her MA at the Courtauld in 2019. She's now the Joyce Blackman Curatorial Fellow in African American Art and Art of the African Diaspora at Memphis Brooks Museum of Art. And we have Wells Frey Smith, who completed both her BA and her MA at the Courtauld and finished her studies with us in 2017. She's now the Assistant Curator of Special Projects at Whitechapel Gallery in London. So it's great to have you both here. And without further delay, I'm going to hand straight over to Heather to talk a bit more about your career and your current work. So Heather, if you're ready, over to you. Sure. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be taking part in this discussion. Thank you, Imogen, for the invitation. Um, as she said, my name is Heather Nichols. Um, I'm 26 years old and I completed my master's in history of art from the Courtauld in 2019. I was on the course New York, Paris, London, 1880 to 1940, led by David Peters Corbett. And I currently live and work in Memphis, Tennessee in the US in the Mid-South region um, and moved here right after completing my master's. So I've been here about a year and a half now. Um, I currently hold the position of the Joyce Blackman Curatorial Fellowship in African American Art and Art of the African Diaspora, which believe it or not, does fit on my business card. And in this position, I have sort of three main roles. Um, first off, to curate an exhibition based on my original research on a topic of my choosing. Second, to publish a catalog that will accompany that exhibition. And third, to start a collecting group that will focus on acquiring works by African American and African diasporic artists for the permanent collection. Um, I have many other tasks that fall outside of that area, but um, for the most part, my focus is on the first two parts. Um, and I thought I would say a few words about the exhibition I'm working on. Um, so it's called Persevere and Resist, The Strong Black Women of Elizabeth Catlett. And it will open at the museum on June 5th and close on August 29th. Um, it will have approximately 35 objects, um, prints and sculptures created by the artists between the early mid 1940s to the late 2000s. Um, the late great Elizabeth Catlett, for those of you who do not know, um, she was, in my opinion, one of the most important American art history um, artists in, in American art history, um, namely because of her ability to so powerfully articulate a full range of African American experiences at a time when Black stories were very limited or one dimensional. Um, her messages of the necessity of racial and gender equality transcend time and I would argue are as relevant today as they were when she began her practice in the first half of the 20th century. Um, her career spanned over six decades and it was defined in large part by her permanent move to Mexico um, and by extension the newfound freedom she experienced in her adopted homeland. Um, without the constraints of Jim Crow segregation and its aftermath, all of which hindered artistic expression and other freedoms in the US for African Americans, Catlett created her very unique aesthetic of blending uh, influences of African sculpture, Mesoamerican and Mexican artists, European modernism, and the work of her fellow African American artists working in the visual arts in the mid 20th century. I'm currently in the middle of writing wall text and labels this week, um, and I'm working very closely with our publishers who are so wonderful, uh, Paul Hoberton Press in London on the exhibition catalog, and that will include uh, essays by myself and the great Catlett scholar and expert Dr. Melanie Herzog. As far as my career path thus far, um, I've worked for several American and international nonprofits and for-profit art institutions, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art in their editorial and education departments, the New Museum of Contemporary Art in their curatorial department, the Courtauld Gallery Print Room, the Museum of Modern Arts, Drawings and Prints curatorial department, Sproni Westwater and Andre Rosen Galleries in New York. For two years, I also worked as a project research associate for then independent art historian, Dr. Denise Morell on her exhibition, Posing Modernity, the Black Model from Monet and Matisse to Today, which opened at the Wallet Gallery at Columbia and later traveled to Paris, where it was the Le Modèle Noir de Jericho Amatisse, which traveled to the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Um, 
In terms of uh, networks and contacts developed um, at the Courtauld and how they've come in handy, um, hilariously, I have this job in large part due to Courtauld connections. Um, when I was doing my master's, I had two part-time jobs um, at the school, one of which was a print room assistant in the Courtauld Gallery. So I spent about a day or so a week uh, cataloging works on paper in the print room alongside three PhD students. Uh, my boss in that position is the curator of uh, drawings at the Courtauld Gallery. And one of her other print room assistants in earlier years who completed her master's and PhD at the Courtauld, um, who later worked for the Courtauld Gallery was Dr. Rosamond Garrett, who is now my direct supervisor at the Brooks. So very small world. <laughs> and essentially this fellowship opportunity came up when the Brooks was looking for um, a fellow in this area. Rosman reached out to Ketty, asked if she knew anyone and she did because I was working as one of her assistants. Um, so after a series of virtual interviews and chats um, and I was in DC for a bit doing research for my dissertation, they flew me out to Memphis and then I was offered the position and I accepted. Um, and so I just thought I would close my little five to seven minute <laughs> intro by uh, answering the sort of question of what is the most rewarding aspect of what I, what I do or what I'm doing. Um, I would say that getting to tell historically under-researched yet extremely important and at times difficult stories within a legacy institution is really important to me. Um, the museum I currently work for was not desegregated until the 1960s, so it wasn't that long ago that uh, people like me would have been barred from entering into the museum space for the most part. Um, and the position is super rare um, in that I get to take a deep dive into something I'm really passionate about and have the space, time, and resources to do that in this position. Um, not to mention in a few months, fingers crossed, um, I'll have a publication under my belt, which will have my name on the spine, which is very exciting and something that doesn't really happen to emerging scholars. Um, and I really hope, um, and I'm doing everything in my power to make it so that Memphis, which is over 65% African-American will come out and see the exhibition. Um, and I'm hoping that by just showcasing uh, black bodies, um, black voices in the space will allow people to feel seen and heard and respected. Um, and you can see how wonderful Catlett's uh, talents are and hopefully make her closer to a household name in the US and, and overseas. So um, looking forward to answering questions and um, that's it from me. Thank you, Heather. Well, that's a real kind of roller coaster of a journey. You've done so much in such a short time. Um, so interesting. And of course, the thing that I always kind of go straight into and notice is you talk immediately about networking and how important it is. And I think sometimes people feel that they don't have a network themselves. But what you've shown is wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you are building your community. And it's about opening your eyes and opening your ears and listening and noticing that these people are your community. And one of the messages I am afraid I do bang on about quite a lot is whoever you're studying with, whoever you're working with, they're your community. Work out who you want to stay in touch with. So I thought that was a great opener, Heather. Thank you so much. Wells, why don't you uh, give us an introduction to your story? Brilliant, Karen. Thank you. And hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you. And thank you too, Heather. That was so fascinating. And what struck me in your story is how similar in some respects it has been to mine, but also how the jobs we do as curators, I think, are really different. So I hope I can offer a bit of a separate but complementary perspective. So for introduction, my name is Wells Bray Smith. Um, I did my undergraduate at the Courtauld, graduating in 2015. And then I went directly on to do the MA curating the Art Museum in 2016, but technically graduated in 2017 because of the academic schedule. I currently hold the position of assistant curator of special projects at Whitechapel Gallery. Um, I am one of four assistant curators and one of nine essentially in the exhibitions team as a whole. And my role I would say is incredibly varied. I think I have probably one of the most diverse roles in the institutions because um, what you may already know about Whitechapel is that we don't have a permanent collection. We were founded in 1901 at the time to bring great art to the people of East London. And that is very much a 
legacy and a mission that we still uphold today. But in not having a collection, we have an opportunity really to stage temporary exhibitions. And we do that through our kind of main exhibition program, but also through commissions, through collection displays. So we invite private collections or corporate collections to show their work in our space. Um, and through a really remarkable and robust education program with school groups, communities, families, um, and young people. And as someone who works at special projects, what that essentially means is that I handle a lot of the curatorial work that may not necessarily be our main show. So one of my primary responsibilities is looking after a prize we, we run called the Max Mara Art Prize for Women. Um, and this is a collaboration between Whitechapel Gallery and the fashion house Max Mara that has been running now for 15 years. Um, and it affords a woman or an artist who identifies as female every two years, the gift essentially of time and space to produce new work. So the winner is given a bespoke six month residency in Italy, uh, fully funded by Max Mara. She receives a full production budget to make a whole new body of work that then is shown in a solo exhibition at Whitechapel, which I curate. Uh, and then that travels to Collezione Maramotti, which is the space of the founder of Max Mara and a really important private collection in Northern Italy. Um, so I look after that, that's a kind of prize and a residency and a show. I also am working on a public commission with the local council, uh, the council of Tower Hamlets, and we will be making a permanent two-dimensional artwork that will exist in the city of London. Um, I am also working on an open call exhibition called the London Open, which is very much part of Whitechapel's history. It's been in our exhibition program since 1932, and it's uh, an opportunity to hear from artists working in the capital and to learn about what they're making. So this year we received 2,600 applicants um, and I was on the jury for selecting the work and we'll be building that into a show that will premiere next summer. And as part of uh, that, I'm also working on a late night festival. So all of this is to say that a curatorial path might involve exhibitions, but it might also involve ways to tell stories about art and artists um, that exist outside of a typical exhibition type space. To get to Whitechapel, I think I had quite an elliptical route. Um, similarly to Heather, I did a lot of work experiences and internships uh, as a student in London. When I was at the Courtauld, I did a work experience at Christie's Auction House. Um, I worked at Michael Werner Gallery, and then as part of my MA curating the Art Museum program, I was a research assistant at the Barbican on the UK's really first survey of the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, the Serpentine did a show in 1981, and this was like the next big show to introduce uh, his work to UK audiences. Um, and I felt after doing that, that I really wanted to be a curator, but honestly, I could not get a curatorial job. And so from there, I went and I worked at a commercial gallery for two years. Um, and that was a fantastic experience that I hope to be able to share with some of you later in the discussion. But I, I thought at that point that there was absolutely no way from working in a commercial gallery, dealing really closely with the market, that I would then be able to segue back into a museum or into an institutional position. Um, and lo and behold, you know, that happened. Uh, I would also say that the Courtauld Network never really felt like a network to me until this year. People had always said to me, use it, use it, use it. And I think I um, didn't quite understand the importance necessarily of the Courtauld name until I actually went to go work at the US. And similarly to Heather, I did an internship at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And suddenly everyone was introducing me to 
colleagues and people who I never thought I would have access to because I went to the Courtauld and they did as well. So that was a fascinating thing. Um, but now I'm finding in my fifth year, I guess, of working, suddenly these people that I were students with are now my colleagues across institutions at other galleries. I do business with them all the time. And it's something that really just happened this year, but has been so powerful um, in firstly, just making work really fun because they're, you know, my friends and they share similar missions and similar goals to I do. Um, but also, you know, connected and, and easy. Um, I would say to end also on the most rewarding aspect of what I do, um, my, because I work primarily with living artists and contemporary artists on work and new work that they are making now, I think really I see my role as being in service of them and their vision. So the exciting thing is getting to be part of a project from the beginning to then having it, the work be made, be up on the walls, be in a space um, and get to share that with the public. You know, that's why I wanted to do what I do. That's brilliant, Wells. Again, I'm loving the fact that we're talking about how do you use networking, your contacts, how do you work out when you recognise them, what you can do to all work together. And there's mutual benefit in it all the time. Um, sometimes, I was mentioning earlier to um, the team that sometimes people are really nervous of getting in contact with alumni, but most people want to help. Um, and it's an interesting conversation for them to start to get to know people who will be coming through later. Um, we don't seem to have any questions yet, so I'm going to take advantage of that point and I'm going to ask you both the first question. If you think back to your time in the Courtauld, what was the most important you, thing you learned there that got you to this point now, do you think? Was it something that you learned in terms of your knowledge, your academics, or were there skills that you learned in terms of your career trajectory? Um, Wells, do you want to go first? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I would say it, it definitely had to do with skills, actually, rather than academics. I think I might take the academic background for granted, and I feel like everyone at the course world is really intelligent, and you've got it, so use it. But um, my my experience at the course world was that, like, they give you a penny, and like, I would take a pound or like ten pounds, and I mean that in the sense that it was so ripe and full of opportunity. So. I worked a lot. Um, I did the East Wing uh, exhibition project. Um, I also started TEDx Courtauld, which I don't know if that's still in existence, but a TEDx conference was something that I initiated there. Um, and that led me to also produce the first ever ResFest, which I also don't know if that's still happening. But those skills of producing, building a program, thinking about stories and which stories I wanted to tell and why they needed to be told and going through that kind of intellectual exercise with tutors and peers um, was 100% the most valuable thing. So my advice is if you have the time and the means and the wherewithal and the verve, and I know we're in lockdown, but you know, the opportunity, um, use, use the core tool and the op extracurricular opportunities that are there because they were incredibly helpful for me. Excellent, that's really good advice. Heather, was it something different for you? Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, obviously the academic experience has helped me um, sort of hone my research skills as I'm taking on this exhibition project. Um, but I would also say that um, before I went to the Courtauld, I spoke with a friend of mine from college who was at the Courtauld a year and a half before me or a year before. And I remember asking her what she thought and she really loved it. And she just said, my cohort was great. The one downside is I didn't get a chance to meet a lot of people from other cohorts or in other courses. And so going into that, I made a very concerted effort to get to know people, not only throughout the MA, but um, undergrads, PhDs, um, 
you know, and it's, it's served me well, both in terms of finding a community while I was there um, for nine months. Um, and I would walk into a room and I could, you know, recognize someone and people would be like, how do you know them? And I'm like, oh, I just met them down the hall, you know, like, or we were in the library together and we just like, you know, and, but also to acknowledge that we're all in this field that is actually quite small and that the odds are, is that I may work with this person again or see this person again, or, maybe even I apply to a job and they see my name and they're like, oh, I know Heather. And, you know, it's kind of playing the long game because obviously you can't predict any of these things, but um, also just, you know, it's good to be nice to people just also really. Um, so I think, I think just making sure I made a concerted effort to talk to as many people as I could and just um, hang in the sort of communal spaces to just strike up conversations with undergrads as a graduate student and vice versa, I think is really important. Excellent. That's a, that's a really nice mixture of things though. I think that basically get yourself as involved as you can. It is more restricted now, but there are still things that you can do. Um, so there's some more questions coming in now. So how did you learn what specific area within curated you, within curating that you wanted to work in? Or do you feel like you're still discovering as you go along? So Wells, you're working with living artists. Um, Heather, yours is a very different kind of curatorial fellowship working in a very specific area. How did you decide and how did you make moves towards that? Or did you just take it because it was there? Heather, do you want to go first this time? Work. Yeah, um, so I actually studied, um, so I studied art history in undergrad in the US. Um, and I actually wrote my, um, I guess, undergraduate thesis on uh, 18th century French depictions of servants and domestic workers in paintings. So it was like a very different project, but the sort of thread of um, underrepresented, lesser known, um, untold stories, that thread has continued in the work that I do now. And I think that's always been something that's really fascinated me. Um, I think as I learned more about Black artists, I began very focused on um, continuing to work within this legacy of telling those stories. Um, and so I found some positions um, when I was working at MoMA, I applied for a job there that was a project um, on a contemporary Congolese artist. And I happened to had been taking a class on contemporary African in politics the semester before. So I had pretty solid foundation of um, specifically the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and that ended up being useful for this particular job in addition to linguistic skills and French specifically for that. Um, so I think it's trying really hard to um, develop the skills that you have and the opportunities that you have, even if you can't like see where they're, they're gonna be coming in handy. I mean, today, I saw um, a couple speaking Italian and I had enrolled in an Italian class and I just struck up a conversation. And I mean, I'm not getting a job from that. You know, it's just a nice, um, you can connect with more people, the more sort of experiences you have. Um, and so I think that um, as I learn more about myself and my own interests and my desire to see more black artists in museum spaces and exhibiting their work, it's just kind of continued with that. Excellent, thank you. Um, I would say in a kind of, in the spirit of radical honesty that I am still finding my curatorial voice. And I think I never am expecting to develop it in such a way when it's fixed. I think one of the things that I'm finding really cool about the moment that we're in is that histories are being retold and shaken up like colleagues like Heather. Um, and that means that so too are my positions and the way that I might approach knowledge and sharing knowledge. Um, I would say, however, though, that I think I always had quite a strong footing in the world of contemporary art. And that was something that really emerged in my BA. Um, I got, I just got lucky in the sense that I like really didn't want to study anything medieval and I just didn't get those modules. <laughs> so, so my kind of academic background really has always been in like, I would say post-World War I, 1914 modernism onward. Um, and I also felt certain 
having had experience at the Barbican and also having experience at the Met that while I could do the research thing and that I would say is like the number one skill that you need to bring to being a curator is being an amazing researcher. Um, I also knew that I wanted really to work with artists and when I worked at Pace, which was the commercial gallery I worked at, I worked a lot with female artists specifically and found through trial and error that the shows I loved the most was when they were producing new work and I got to be part of that production process and share ideas with them. And, and then when this role at Whitechapel Gallery came along that had a focus on women um, with the Max Marr Art Prize for Women and also on commissions and on making new work, it just felt like a perfect fit at the time. Excellent. That's uh, that's really honest, and I think it's good that you you don't just go straight into something. You start to build up your understanding of your own voice and and look out then for different things that help you to develop that and evolve. Um, a very practical question here now. Both of you were able to do what sounds like lots of work experience and internships, um, which I guess served as stepping stones into further work. How did you navigate doing all those things around your studies, including how did you manage the finance of all of that? Heather's un unmuted immediately. She's definitely got something to say on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. Um, and one that continues to be a problem, but there seem to be small steps um, being made to try to remedy that issue or try to attack it in different ways. Um, of the internships that I did, um, starting from my first one, which was not in museums, but was actually in fashion, which was my first love, um, till when I got a, a paid job, I think I did about a dozen um, unpaid internships. Um, fortunately, um, my undergraduate institution offered um, funding for students. Um, so I think for two or three summers in college, I worked um, at some of the institutions I mentioned earlier, and those were unpaid, but I was able to receive maybe $2,000 um, to subsidize housing, um, subsidize transportation. Um, so I don't know if those opportunities are everywhere or you know, if they are able to sort of, um, you're able to live comfortably on them alone. Um, but I was able to benefit from those for sure. Um, and then in other cases, um, I think I was a bit nuts in some ways with um, internships during the semester, at least in undergrad, I would stack my classes so that I would have them only Mondays and Wednesdays, and then I would intern Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, um, which did not make for a particularly exciting semester <laughs> um, of seeing friends. Um, but I think, I, I think at that point in time, I was very determined, um, and I still am for sure determined to get to where I wanna be faster, but, um, in some semesters, I, I was able to make those sacrifices to my uh, free time and personal time. Um, but I'm not sure if things are hopefully better in the UK or um, in programs uh, to support students doing unpaid work. My position in the print room was paid. My position when I worked for the research forum was, was paid um, at the Courtauld. And um, that allowed me to, you know, have some income while I was a student. Um, but uh, those opportunities are few and far between, it seems. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, I think the US and UK are rather different here. It's actually illegal for you to do work, proper work, and not be paid for it. Um, there are only two exceptions. And I'll, I go into that a little bit on the VLE. So if you're interested or want to know more, then you can check that out there. Wells, what about you? How did you manage your time? This is all about time management and organisation, isn't it? I mean, big time. I, I mean, I think I remember as a third year, maybe only having two days where I had contact with a professor or lectures or kind of supervision. So um, similarly to Heather, I basically just split my week and I thought, okay, these three days I'll be at uni, these three days I'll be at work. Um, and when I say work, you know, very much was a work experience. I never worked in one place for longer than a term and it was always part-time. And in a commercial setting, when I worked at Michael Werner Gallery, it always was on a Saturday as well. So I um, used one of my day, my working days, I guess, as on a, on a weekend. 
but I just, I would say you have to be resilient and you have to be organized. Um, and it also means, I think, just being a very efficient academic to like read what you need to read, know your point, know your argument and, and just get it done, which isn't helpful advice. It's more of a lifestyle, but um, it worked for me. I think that's brilliant. I think there's some really good points there um, about how you manage it in a way that works for you. Now we've got a, an old chestnut here that I'm very pleased to see has come up. How necessary is a master's degree in terms of pursuing a career in curating? Who would like to take that first? I can take that. Um, my, my initial response to that first is what type of curator would you like to be? And getting really specific about that, whether you wanna work in an institution, you wanna be an independent curator, um, you're actually interested in commissions, biennales, gallery shows, being itinerant, you know, f figure out what your remit is and what makes your heart sing. Um, because my, my personal sense is that if you would like to be a curator in an institution, because the field is so oversaturated and competitive, you probably do need a master's degree, not, not in any practical way, but because that's a really quick way basically for HR departments to like look at skills and say, do they have this, do they not? You know, it's a, a first thing in the weeding of application processes. Um, but if, if you don't want to work in an institution and you have a different idea of what a curator is, then the world might be more your oyster um, and you may not need a master's. And you did go an alternative route in a sense coming from the commercial world. So what did you do coming from the commercial art world to come back and be a curator in the public world? What, what was your USP in doing that? Yeah, my USP was fundraising, that mm. institutions are, in the UK at least, are in a really unfortunate position where because a large percentage of our money comes from government funding and that has been consistently declining, mm -hmm. we are in a position of needing to rely more on private philanthropy. And having worked in an exhibitions role at Pace, but which is also a major sales machine. Um, and in that role, having really intimate access to collectors and people who had major spending power, I essentially was able to, in my interview at Whitechapel, I think say like, look, I've got this exhibitions experience, but like, if you want me to handle a relationship with one of your biggest funders, which is Max Mara, I can do that because I've worked in the sales role. I know how the market works. If you need to raise money, let me help you. I can do that too. So actually one, one of the big projects I worked on this year was a fundraising auction um, that ha was hugely successful because I just tapped really <laughs> into an emerging market. Um, and it's not a kind of typical curator's role, but I think increasingly being able to fundraise is incredibly valuable. I think that's a really good insight. Heather, did you have anything to add in terms of masters or PhDs, the kind of yeah. qualifications that are kind of minimum standard? Yeah, I was also gonna say, um, I think it, not only is it the type of institution you wanna work in, I think it's the, uh, time period that you're interested in focusing on. So what I've been told for the most part, although, you know, depending on who you talk to, things can change. Um, if you're interested more in contemporary, um, a master's may or may not be useful, but you don't necessarily need to do a PhD. Whereas for historic topics, um, you are perhaps in a better position if you, um, do a PhD. And so it's, it's interesting for me, I see one of the questions about continuing in with schooling um, because I kind of straddle this strange, not, well, this period of mo er, modern contemporary, um, but I'm not contemporary. 
um, I'm kind of going through that process now of, of um, thinking about whether returning to school is my next step. And I think it is actually, I think I'll be applying to PhDs in the coming year or so, um, just because I think um, I'm kind of the cover all your bases kind of person. Um, and I, um, I also would say that I have, I'm financially stable and that makes a huge difference. Um, from when I was doing these unpaid internships to, to now. Um, and it helps that I live in a much more affordable place now than I have in any other time period in my life, like London or New York. Um, but I definitely think that, um, and I also want to, to learn more. I, I miss school a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot I don't know. <laughs> and so I, I want to be able to have that experience. And, and for me personally also just to see um, I complain a lot about the sort of sad um, statistics of, of women and black women and women of color in the field um, and those who have doctorates. And I figure that instead of complaining about it um, and being um, saddened by it, I will do something uh, and make it better. And that is by me uh, doing it myself also. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a small add on, but. Yeah, no, that's really useful. I'm going to stick with you for a second because a very specific question has come up. And then the follow-up question, I think, is for both of you. So the first question is, do you have any advice for finding fellowship opportunities so quickly following your MA? And then for both of you, any tips in terms of how do you stand out in the application process? Um, so for this particular fellowship, again, it was a super weird kind of worlds collide um, thing. I do have some friends who found um, not fellowships, but um, curatorial assistant roles, which usually are fixed term. Um, and obviously uh, during a pandemic, um, I, I recommend to, to anyone looking for a job to um, look for fellowships. I, I'm a fellow and therefore when uh, we had furloughs, um, I was not subjected to furlough because I was externally funded. Um, so uh, my, my uh, funding does not come out from you know, overall operations. So I was able to continue working. Um, and in such a weird time like this, um, I think job stability is obviously something we all could, could wish for and, and um, desire the most. Um, but I mean, I looked at everything from Fulbright's um, to individual um, institutions fellowships. Um, this one happened first, so I didn't really get too far in that process of looking for, for jobs and fellowships. So I can't speak to that exactly. Um, but I think it's, it's a lot of setting job alerts, talking to people, going on LinkedIn, which is somewhat useful for our field. I think it's more, it's better for networking than for finding jobs, I would say. Um, going to websites from institutions that you like to see if they post job listings, because at least in the US, um, we have NIFA, um, which is a, a big, has a big classified section, but there'll be some institutions that aren't advertised on there. So you have to go to individual ones to kind of get a full picture. Um, it kind of just doesn't stop. You kind of just <laughs> are always looking. Um, and uh, making sure, for me at least, when I get alerts now, knowing friends of mine who are finishing up their masters now, and just making sure I send them along to them because uh, it is a harder time right now to be finishing up than when I did. Yeah. And what about your tips for the application process? How did you, what did you do to stand out? Yeah, I mean, um, I would say that um, reaching out to people, um, reaching out to people generally, not just when you're looking for a job is always a good thing because um, I always fear that it's, pretty transparent if I reach out to someone and it's like, oh, I saw there's a listing at fill in the blank place. Um, and to make sure maintain those relationships every you know six months or so, um, which is just good on its own, but also to make sure that you know people feel like you're genuinely interested. Um, they get to know about you, they can speak on your behalf um, if they work for an institution and your name comes up. Um, but that's not, I mean, it's all again the long the long game, and nothing nothing quite works. A plus B equals C, unfortunately, for the most part. And I think um, having sort of a million uh, fingers in different jars at a given time is kind of the way that I have um, gone about it, which is exhausting, mm -hmm. um, but uh, has proven useful in some in some cases. That's brilliant. Thank you, Wells. What about what do you do to stand out? Yeah, 
this is maybe going to be the most boring advice one could ever give. So brace yourself. But in my experience with my Whitechapel application is that they will have a job description. They will tell you exactly what they're looking for, what your role will be and what skills they want you to have. In writing your cover letter, name every single one of those skills and prove how you have it and you have that experience. And I literally had it as like a bullet point checklist and I went, it was like my topic sentence for every paragraph. It was like, you want me to be a good editor? I am an excellent editor and this is how I've done it. And I would say I very much fell into a, a path where I was like, I just want people to think I'm a visionary and I have amazing ideas and I'm gonna bring all these things to the table and wow, I'm gonna wow them. And the reality is, is that they're probably looking at hundreds of applications. On the one hand, they want you for your ideas, but on the other hand, they want you for, this is gonna sound so cynical, I'm so sorry, but they want you for your talent and what you can do. So prove that you can do it um, and, and make it so easy for them to see your capability, basically. Can I add one thing to that? Sure. Um, I was just gonna say, I know for one particular institution, they run an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So um, you, and I found this out much, much later after I'd submitted many applications and never heard back and was kind of like, okay, well, maybe it's just not in the cards um, to literally use the exact wording um, in many cases when you are writing the cover letter. Um, in some cases, they'll ask for like an extended resume. So just write it all out. Um, and, you know, obviously in those cases, you can have all the experience, but if, if um, the algorithm doesn't pick up on those on those words, um, you may just not even be seen by HR in the first place. Exactly. And I think we at the Cordial too are taught to be such lyrical, effluent writers yeah. with powerful descriptive language that can paint a story and tell something so beautifully. And this is an exercise in doing the opposite, <laughs> really. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And it comes up time and time again when people come to appointments with me. I'm having to teach them just to slightly unpick their beautiful essay style and just go straight for the meat. You know, what are the 16 skills they're looking for? OK, let's take them in turn. What is your great example for each of those before you even start on your CV and cover letter? Um, and for those of you that are still thinking about, oh, I wonder how I should manage my CVs and cover letters, there's a great set of um, resources on the VLE. Do go in and have a look and then book an appointment to come and see me and I'll help you go through, make sure it's tailored um, the way it needs to be. There are a lot of pop questions coming up about MAs and PhDs. So I'm just going to ask this very briefly, this one about um, whether either of you think you would be tempted to go back and do a PhD in order to further your curatorial opportunities? Or do you think you're in now, you're happy with what you've got um, and you'll just carry on finding new posts um, as each one comes to an end? Heather, what about you? Um, yeah, um, as I said, I think I'm. I think uh, that is the next step for me. Um, so I will be undertaking that fun process of applications probably very shortly. Um, just because I think, uh, well, for the reasons I mentioned, there's many reasons why I think it would be useful for me um, and beneficial for me. Um, also just the, the idea that I can complete something like that um, would be an achievement on its own, I think. Um, so yes, for me, likely yes, in the foreseeable future. Excellent. Wells? Yeah, I think never say never. I, I definitely miss academia and I miss the process of learning but I, I also think in the role that I'm currently in um, it's not necessary and so much of the research and the work that I do it comes through like lived experiences and processes as they develop rather than doing really robust and rigorous historical research so um, it doesn't feel like a necessity for me that I need as a stepping stone to get to the next stage. Great, so it's really nice to see that there are different ways you can look on it. So it can depend on where you are, 
what you're curating and so on. So I think that's really good to have that lovely contrast and, and the variability there. Um, here's one, how did or didn't your topics for dissertation relate to your curatorial trajectory? Are there any suggestions you have for those who are just embarking on research for dissertations? Heather, do you want to take that first? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so I would say that um, the project I'm currently working on, um, the artist actually studied under the artist that I wrote about for my dissertation, um, or she was one of the artists that I wrote about for my dissertation. So I wrote about um, a short-lived artist collective in the 1940s and 50s in Washington, DC. Um, and one of the founders was a professor or a teacher, um, an artist in her own right, but she taught Elizabeth Catlett. Um, so it kind of relates and, and to, know, to know about um, her uh, experience, um, her practice as she was developing it is useful um, to kind of get to know a bit more about the artist as I was writing about her and to have a bit more context. Um, and then in terms of embarking, that process of embarking on research, um, I went to a talk in DC um, where I'm from when I was home for break, I guess between like the second and third term or whatever, the fall, winter. Um, and I went to a talk at a library that happened to be about the art scene in DC in the 1940s. And that was kind of the catalyst for me thinking more and more about how I wanted to talk about my hometown and the burgeoning black art scene in the 40s and 50s. Um, so that was kind of by chance. I almost didn't go to that talk, um, but I would say um, in this weird virtual world, um, the more sort of things that pique your interest, um, attend, you never know, there could be an idea that kind of pops into your head as a result. Or in the case of that, it was, you know, a, a very um, a preeminent scholar saying, you know, no one's talked about the DC art scene in these years. And I thought, Oh, I want to talk about that, but like in a very specific way. Um, so yeah, it's again, it's like being open, attending things that may or may not be very good or interesting for you, um, but just keeping your mind open and, and reading things that um, have an interest to you in some way. Yeah, this is, there's a great careers theory called planned happenstance, which says rather than having a plan for five years hence that you work your way towards. You just do all the things that most interest you, go to stuff, read stuff, get in contact with people who look interesting and you build from now rather than building towards the future. So I think that can be a very useful um, method for some people. I've certainly been terrible at trying to work out a five year plan. I can't do it. So plan to happen something worked really well for me. Wells, have you sort of anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I, I would just add to that that see and read as much as you can and have the courage to do it in a way that's genuine in the sense that, you know, your tutor might have a reading list and might think you have to go down a certain route. This was my experience when I did my BA2 dissertation. Um, I did a module on Chinese contemporary art and had just done a bunch of research about an underground performance art scene and my Tudor Wenny, who I like absolutely love, and she's amazing, but she was like, oh, that was really good. You should keep going with that. Um, and I did, and it all worked out in the end, but I think my learning from that process was like, if I had been honest and genuine and courageous enough, I probably would not have chosen that topic. I kind of went for it because she, it was I, that seemed like the right thing to do. But from my master's thesis, similarly to Heather, um, I saw, I went and saw an exhibition, didn't think that, you know, didn't think it was gonna have really any bearing on my life. And when I came to thinking about dissertation topics, I basically could not shake this show. And it was a work of a, a contemporary Colombian artist called Doris Salcedo that was at the Guggenheim in New York. And it prompted me into a whole line of inquiry of thinking about um, how art communicates to us. And her work is very based on trauma and the lived experiences of people whose homes have been possessed and who might have been displaced or have been victims of Colombian violence, violence in Colombia. And that 
led me to also think about a type of curating where we might be able to communicate not cognitively and not intellectually, but through more of an embodied experience, which a hundred percent feeds into what I do now, not in a way that I'm always conscious of, but you know, as we think about communicating with audiences and how we tell stories and what messages people get, you know, her work and writing about her work in that way has been a really interesting and important stepping stone um, into curating. Excellent. So I think these are, these are lovely examples of how something in particular sets you off in a particular direction um, and you follow it along until you add to all those different think, feelings and ideas until it builds into something that becomes a bit of a, a momentum for you in your career. I think, I think you can change as well. There's some research recently that says that people have very different careers in their lives these days. Um, and that might be five different careers and 12 different jobs, um, which is very different to when I was first setting out 100 years ago, when you were supposed to stay in the same place and just go up a ladder, which I was never very keen on. So I think we're coming to the end of our time. I'm going to ask Wells and Heather to think carefully about two or three last tips, either reiterating things that they said earlier that I think are really key. But if you had two or three messages you wanted people to take away, what would they be? In the meantime, um, we're going to put in the link to the feedback form. The feedback form is really important to us. We've done a little bit of a review of the programme so far, and we look at all of these comments and take account of what you're feeling about it and, and what is working for you or not working for you. Um, please, please do answer it. Uh, and answer all the questions. It's very, very quick. Um, so Heather and Wells, do you think you're ready to give um, a, a little bit of your final insight and wisdom into what people need to think about or what they can do to reach uh, the point where they could become a curator, assistant curator themselves in whatever kind of context? Heather. Sure. I was going to say, you know, take everything with a grain of salt because I am still navigating this, figuring this out um, and finding my way um, in ways that I was not expecting. Um, I would say that um, being flexible <laughs> and open is always good, um, regardless of one's career, obviously. Um, but when certain positions are so competitive and so hard to find and so hard to get, um, even when there's so many people that are perfectly equipped to do a job. Um, working in other aspects of museums or even in the general arts ecosystem was advice that I was given. Um, the whole for-profit, non-for-profit division, you know, I talked to some people and they were like, well, you know, don't do this because you'll be stuck in this and you won't be able to go to this if you do that um, was something that I heard a lot um, in the beginning. And I, as I mentioned, I've worked in galleries before um, and I've worked in museums more so than in galleries. Um, and I think a lot of the skills are transferable. <laughs> and honestly, you're learning about the entire ecosystem when you're working for for-profits, auction houses, non-for-profits, um, other types of art spaces, theaters, um, and I think all of that is really beneficial um, and, you know, making sure to, to reach out to people who are doing things that you would like to be doing. I think link, one of the wonderful things about LinkedIn is that um, if you're like me, you'll like scroll down to the bottom and see like where they went to school, what they studied, what were they doing when, and you compare like what they were in school to doing and then were they working at the same time? Like, when did they do that? Um, in an almost obsessive way, I would say, at least in the beginning, just because I was like, how do I become you or do what you're doing? Because I like what you're doing. Um, and I think on the flip side, um, it feels strange to say that I'm at a point where people are asking me for advice, because I still think, like I said, I'm figuring it out, but to make sure you're paying it forward. Um, and um, I've talked to a number of prospective Courtauld students this year alone. <laughs> Um, who've reached out to me asking my advice and my thoughts and um, Americans who are considering UK programs and weighing US UK programs and how to pay for it. And um, I'm always happy to talk to people about um, my, how I've done things. Um, obviously it's only so useful, 
Um, but uh, I find that useful and, and, and hopefully um, can give back in that way as well. And we talked earlier, didn't we, about LinkedIn and that you're happy for people to request um, a LinkedIn connection. So both, both Wells and Heather are very happy if you want to, on the back of this, say, I really found the talk interesting. And I'd love to follow up with a chat. Wells, you were about to start. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. Yeah. Um, well, no, just to say absolutely would be really happy to speak to anyone. And I think um, I one of the things I found when I was starting my career was that I had a very weird affliction, which was that I basically got starstruck by curators where I was like, oh, I can't contact them. Oh, they have the job that I want. But I think it's really important to remember that like these people, we are just people too. And actually we're really honored to be asked for help. Um, so don't be afraid to connect. I think my advice within that though is be genuine like tell us about you and what you're interested in what makes you excited what you're finding like difficult to navigate what do you want to learn I think the more specific it is to who you are and like where you want to go just the more meaningful the relationship can be um I would also say Heather mentioned this at the very beginning, but um, my mentor, who was the curator at the Barbican, who I've really stayed in touch with, I remember when I was doing my master's, she just said, be nice, because you have no idea who, what, who you're going to work with, and this, this world is so small. So I really would recommend that, especially among your students and your classmates and peers now, because um, in you know the crudest terms like you're a bitch to someone at a party and in 10 years time you're requesting a loan from them and like they don't want to give it to you because you are not very nice to them at a party so and like that is real so like be nice um and I think also yeah you just never know where things are going to lead um I think if you're hungry for experience, the more you can do, the better. I really benefited also in being like big fish and small pond and being able to get a lot of skills and experience really quickly. Um, my time at Pace, I was pretty disparaging about before I went into it because I thought I didn't want to be in a commercial setting. But after two years, I worked on 10 exhibitions and six books and that is a huge amount that was then really valuable for my work now at Whitechapel. So, you know, be open, be flexible, be nice. Um, yeah. But I have to say, those are some of the best tips we've had on any of these events. And I've just had one comment come through on the chat, which I think sums it up. It says, ladies, thank you so much. So inspiring. And I'm literally finding the courage to apply to jobs as I type. As I type. Thank you for your time. So I think that's a lovely way to... Oh, I like that as well. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, it may be really hard out there at the minute, but someone has to get the jobs that are there. So believe that you can do it. Believe that you can do it. And I'm there to help you not just while you're a student, but for two years after you graduate. So, you know, make use of that. So thank you so much, Wells and Heather. That was absolutely fabulous. I knew it would be. Um, Imogen, do you just want to say a few final words as we close? Thanks, Karen. And thank you so much, Wells and Heather. That was incredibly interesting. And I think that some of the key takeaways were, you know, to definitely stay connecting with people, attend virtual events. This is a really strange time. And we know that the, you know, curatorial opportunities have dried up a bit during this period, but keep going, keep making connections. And um, what's abundantly clear is how highly regarded Courtauld alumni are um, in applications. So keep going and this period will pass and the market will open up again. Um, so thank you so much for your time, both of you. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. The next event is on the 15th of April um, and it's on PR and marketing. So a slightly different direction, but we hope that you can attend that one and have a great rest of your evening, everyone.